Today we are starting Acts chapter 10. And Acts chapter 10 actually starts the world expansion of the church. But it starts in a very unusual way. Open your Bibles and turn with me to Acts 10, and we're going to look at the first 16 verses today. The scripture reads, There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian Regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, if you mark in your Bibles, you want to mark that. Three in the afternoon, because that's extremely important, and we'll hit on that in just a few minutes. He distinctly saw a vision, an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius. Staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord? The angel told him, Your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is, lodging, <clears throat> he is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one who was with those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray as they were traveling, excuse went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and an object resembling a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure and ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. Father, these are your words. Father, these are the visions that you gave two completely different men. And Father, I pray that as we look at them today, Father, that you will open our hearts and minds to the truth that we need to hear. And Lord, that we will become better examples of Jesus Christ because of your word. In your name we pray, amen. You know, as I was preparing, I was reading a story about Phil Knight. You may not have heard the name, but I guarantee you, you will know the company. See, back in the early 60s, he had a very unusual idea. And what he was going to do, Phil Knight was going to sell imported running shoes out of the back of his station wagon in Portland, Oregon. Now, he was, <clears throat> excuse me, he was an auditor by trade, so he, he looked at the finances, and he said, you know what, if I purchase these shoes from Japan, import them, and sell them at this price, I can make some money. So he did, he imported them, he brought them over and he started selling them. Well, in 1963, his shoes were improved upon because he, his college coach got into the act. His coach was the name of William Bowerman and he modified these shoes to make them better and they kept selling, and they kept selling. You see, Nike started in the back of somebody's station wagon because Phil Knight had the vision to sell. Sometimes when we receive a vision of things, it's something that we see, something that pokes our mind, Sometimes it catches our imagination. Sometimes it's something from a book. 
But I want you to understand that when God gives us a vision, God also will give us a motivation to do the vision. In church, we are Christ's vision for how the lost will be saved. You're the only vision that that will occur by. Now, I'll go ahead and say this. Uh, it, it pains me sometimes to see that there are those that will treat the church like a country club. And what do I mean by that? They'll show up, pay their dues, and, and think that the church owes them something. The church is not a country club. You've heard me talk about what I call the checks box Christians. There are those that treat church like a checks box. And what's that? Well, if I go to Sunday school, if I go to morning worship, if I go to Wednesday night, check, 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 I'm good for a while and I'll, I'll be back whenever I feel bad. They look at church as fire insurance, not as life insurance. And they think as long as they've got their fire insurance premiums paid up that they'll be okay. Church is not that. Church isn't even life insurance. Church and Christ is new life. And see, the third type of person are, are those that they come together to, to revel in what God has done for them during the week. The good, the bad, the tough, the easy. Come together as a time of refreshing. To tell others what God has done. To hear what God has done. In order to be prepared for the week coming up. Now that's really how the world will be won. Is by church members coming to church to be refreshed by the members by God to be filled up to go out and do the work of the church. Now what in the world does all this have to do with the scripture? Because in today's scripture we see that God gave two completely different men different visions. But these visions worked together for one purpose and that one purpose was to change the world. And as these two men came together, the world was changed. And we are the result of that. We are the result of that. First thing I want to take a look at is Cornelius' vision. And we see this in the first six verses there. First thing I want to ask is who was Cornelius? Because that's a, that's a very important question. He was a commander, an army commander. That word centurion means that he was a commander of a group of a hundred soldiers. He was within the Roman army. He was stationed there. He was stationed there in, Jeru not Jerusalem, but in Caesarea near Jerusalem, but he was around Jews. And as he was looking at what they were doing, he was religious because he was studying them. He was studying their religion. And somewhere along the way, he became devout. And what that word devout means is that he was pious and God-fearing. He saw what the Jews were doing. He studied up on them. And he became convinced that that is the way to salvation. That is the way to God. And he feared God because of the all that he had in him. As he looked back at the Jewish history, as he saw what God had done, as he saw what God was doing, he became more and more convinced that the God of the Jews was the God of the entire universe. And the result was he tried to help them in so many different ways. We don't know of all the different ways, but he said he did many charitable deeds. He gave. He helped. 
And it lastly said, and always prayed to God. He was a praying man. He knew a little bit about what he was praying to. But he didn't know God personally. You see, he was an embodiment of what Jesus had talked about in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. He was a seeker of the living God. He was looking for God. You know, there was a song years ago, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Cornelius was looking for love in all the right places. He went to the Jews. He saw what God was doing. He was praying to God. He was seeking Him. But he had no idea that how his world was about to be changed. And when did all this happen? Remember I told you to mark in your Bibles that word three in the afternoon if you mark. And why is that so important? That is a very significant time. You know, sometimes I, I don't like rituals. One of the things that, that I don't like about the Muslim culture is that you have to pray five times a day toward Mecca. You know, if you do something mechanically that many times, it can become just a habit, just routine, just something to do. That was not Cornelius. Sometimes we need that ritual in our lives to remind us that we need to come to God, that we need to seek Him, that we need to lay our cares before Him. And the Jewish time, one of the Jewish times, was at 3 o'clock. And how do we know this? Well, Peter was involved in, act, in a miracle in Acts chapter 3. And the beginning of Acts 3 says this, Now Peter and John were going to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. They were going to meet God at 3. Cornelius was going to meet God at 3. He was praying, and God was about to show up. He didn't know that. But God was about to show up in a very special way. Church, what would happen if God showed up when we prayed? And he showed up. And then what happened? Cornelius was called by name. You see, when we truly seek God, God will find us God comes to us God reveals to us when we truly seek him and what did God do the first thing he did he commended Cornelius for what he did Commended him for his good work, commended him for his prayer life, commended him for commended him for seeking him. You know, Paul wrote, of, wrote about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Listen to what he says in verses 15 through 16. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. Cornelius had that aroma of life that he was giving all. He was seeking the author of life. And God was about ready to change his world because of his seeking. God saw the righteousness that was in Cornelius. Not the works, but the heart behind the works. You know, I was sharing with my Sunday school class when I was teaching high school, all of my children had one goal in mind, and that was day 91. And what is day 91? That's final exam day. And what were they going to do? 
they'd hoped they'd learned enough in the previous 90 days to score good enough on the test and not have to take my class again and walk out. And you know what they would do? Promptly forget the vast majority of what we learned in class. It still goes on today. God is not looking for day 91 Christians. God is looking for those Christians that will take the lessons that he gives and that they apply in their life. That they grow. To this day, I still have a few students that are still using some of the, of the facts and the tips and the techniques that I taught them in various classes for their hobbies and for their works. And they're very successful in that. That's what God is wanting us to do. God is wanting us to take what, what we have learned to apply them and to grow. And that's what it, Cornelius had done. He had taken what he had read, he had applied them, not because he needed to, but because God had it gifted him and empowered him to do that. And God saw what he was doing, saw that he was trying to live out what he believed. And he says, this is a man that is after my heart. Let's show up. When you seek God with all your heart, he will show up. And that's what happened here. See, after he commended them, he said, send for Peter. Send for him. Now, I want you to understand, from Caesarea to Joppa, it's two days there and two days back. This was not going to be an overnight affair. God had already gotten a hold of Cornelius, had already prepared him, and now the scene shifts to Peter and Peter's vision. And Peter, Peter's grown a lot, but Peter is still Peter. You know, I've often referred to him as the apostle with athlete's mouth. Sometimes when he opens his mouth, his foot goes right in. And this is one of those times. You know, he's hungry, and God shows up. God lets down this huge blanket out of heaven and there's all these animals running over it. You know, being from the south, I'd like to think that there's more pigs and stuff on there than anything else. And I'm just imagining, looking at that and I'm seeing all these pigs running over and I'm thinking there's an abundance of barbecue and bacon there. You know, that's one of the things that I ask a lot of preachers. Because when you go back and you look in the Old Testament, you know, pigs are not supposed to be ate. Why would God tell us not to eat pigs, but give us the gift of barbecue and bacon? And I am so glad that he dropped that sheet down to tell us that pigs are clean. And here's Peter. God tells him, eat. It's clean. Peter says, no, -uh. your word says it's not. I'm not going to touch it. Peter, it's me talking. Take and eat. It took three times to get that through Peter's head. Three times for Peter to understand that what God has declared clean is clean. Peter was being prepared for what was going to be happening because he was going to be asked to go to a house that he was not supposed to be in as a Jew. To talk to people he was not supposed to talk to as a Jew. To 
to give them the gospel message. It took him a while to understand, but he finally understood. And church, I want you to know that there's a very important lesson in this for us. You see, we see things through our perspectives and our experiences, and yet we may miss what God is doing because we are looking at it through our eyes, not God's eyes. And I want you to know, I'm standing before you as one that has done that many, many times. I was telling my Sunday school class, I cannot tell you how many times I said, God, you can't do this. And you know what he says? Watch me. And he does something amazing. Church, there are some things that we need to look at it through his eyes, not our eyes. See, the early church was commissioned to take the gospel into all the world, no matter what. And Peter was about to learn that lesson. God had told him to go. And he was about ready to go. I know the Sunday school lesson touched on that this week, and I'm going to touch on it next week, about what God used Peter to do. You see, God had to cut through Peter's prejudices, had to cut through his cultural prejudice, his personal prejudice, in order to do what God told him to do. In order to win the world, they'd have to learn how to reach the world, but not become like the world. But they would also have to learn to see things through somebody else's eyes so they could see how to reach them in a way that will impact them for God. Church, we may have to go through some of that. We may have to rethink how we do some things in order to reach people. Because everybody matters to God. So what does all of this mean? First thing, and we must never, ever, ever overlook this, is that God will provide for those who are truly seeking. When those who seek God with the right heart, God will show up. He did that with Cornelius. And we can point to time and time again from Genesis all the way to Revelation. When people seek God, God shows up. And God changes them. I also want us to understand that when we pray, God will show up. He may not show up the way that we understand or the way that we want him to. But he will show up in a way that will glorify himself, that will make the name of Jesus glorified and known so that others will see. And we've got to be prepared for that. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed for God to answer a situation in one particular way. I honestly think that sometimes God laughs at some of the requests that I make. He laughs and says, you're too short-sighted. And he won't answer that. He'll open up something far greater and far bigger.
And we need to pray in a way that we can see that and that we can open up and so that whenever God does show up, we give him the glory. I also want us to understand that there are some times that we will need to be prepared in order to take the gospel to others. And what do I mean by that? You know, sometimes in today's world, how we learn to give the gospel message 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago falls upon deaf ears today. There's nothing wrong with how we learned it in the past. But sometimes we need to change the approach. Not the message, but the approach. We have too many people today that think they are their own truth. We have too many people today that want to thumb their nose at God. You know, that wasn't the case 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There was that element there, but it was not as prevalent as it is today. Church, we need to be prepared with the gospel message. We also need to be prepared to give it in a way that people can hear it too. In Woodlawn, I feel that we are in the position of Peter. And what do I mean by that? As I talk to you about this, I want you to understand that I'm putting words to things that, that I have heard the times that I've been here. But I have become convinced this week of one thing, and I'm going to share that in a few moments. I do know that there's lost people out there. We all know that. I also know, because I've been in the pulpit now since 2009, in three completely different areas with different populations. And I can tell you this with certainty, that how we did church 10, 20, and 30 years ago sometimes will not reach the people today. And it pains me to say that. No, I'm not saying that we change and become one of these sensor secretive things. That's one of the worst things that could happen. I am not going to stand up here and tickle somebody's ear to get them to come to the gospel message. Well, I'm going to tell you this. People are sinners. Christ is the Savior. And I'm going to ask you the question, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? I'm not going to sugarcoat the gospel. But we do have to find ways to take the gospel better to the people of today that have more hardened hearts than when we were growing up. See, sometimes we can get steeped in tradition that the world needs to come to the church. But the reality is, God didn't call the world to the church. He called the church to the world. That's why he had to, to get Peter's attention. That's why he had to show Peter what he had made clean. Church, 
Church, we need to we need to be changed so that we can go to the world and to save lost sinners. Now, let me be the first to tell you, I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know what needs to be done. But I do know that God has placed it upon my heart. And I am becoming convinced of it more and more every day that what happens here in this church over the next five years will determine the impact this church will have over the next 50 years. We are at that crossroads that Peter was at. As God let that blanket down, Peter had to make the decision to follow what God said. Church, I don't know what's coming. I'm going to be the first to tell you that. And that's why I'm asking you to join me in prayer for vision over what this church needs to do over the next five years to remain relevant on this corner so that Westover Hills hears the gospel proclaimed loudly from this church about who Jesus Christ is so that the world will hear. What are we going to do? I have no idea right now. I do know that he has called us to do this. To go into all the world and to reach and teach those in our Jerusalem, in our Judea, in our Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world with the gospel. And church, we will do that. We will do that. Give you two quick examples and then I'll close up. Just this week, we found out, <clears throat> excuse me, about our baby bottle boomerangs. Thank you so much for collecting over $960 that goes straight to transitions. That helps in their mission of providing the men, the women, and the children with what they need. That is going into our Jerusalem. We are also going to the outermost parts of the world. We are one of 47,000 Southern Baptist churches partnering together and through our partnership, we have somewhere between five and 6,000 missionaries around the world proclaiming the gospel of Christ to the outermost parts of the world. We're still doing it. But we need to be looking at how can we do things better here. I don't know where that's going to lead. And that's what we need to be have, need to be having prayer about. And we'll talk a little bit about that on Wednesday night. I invite you to come out then if you can. But remember, God will always find and help those who seek him. Seek him, obey him, and follow him. And that way, when you see him, you know what he'll say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enjoy eternity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for these two visions. And Father, I thank you for showing Peter how he had to change. And Lord, I thank you that, that he did change. And Lord, for the impact that, that he has had 
Lord, our church wouldn't be here today if he had not had changed. Thank you. And Father, we come to you, and Lord, we just ask for your help, for your guidance, and for your vision about where we are going to be going as a church. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.